Question for you. If you knew that getting the latest and greatest phone as soon as it comes out would mean adding atmosphere emissions that could be avoided, would you do it? What if it also meant that rare metals from within your old phone are put into the trash to be lost forever? Our consumption and disposal of technology has turned into a thing. The good news is there's a growing focus on solving for this e-waste. Let's discuss. You're watching iHeart STEM. Today, we'll tackle one STEM topic I learned from experts. Just four key questions with each answer under one minute or less. No surprise, e-waste has been growing along with our electronic obsession, and it's a problem. The world generated over 136 billion pounds of e-waste in 2022. To help visualize, if we assumed e-waste was the same density as water, the 2022 e-waste would have filled almost 25,000 Olympic swimming pools. There are a few categories driving this significant increase. Devices aren't made to last forever. One can debate whether this is intentional or not. But certain devices are replaced more frequently, adding to e-waste. For example, on average, people replace their phone every two to three years, or vaping your e-cigarettes, anyone? In addition, with devices changing often, this means recycling has to adjust to new designs, which adds waste when this requires a process or a technique change. Certain types of design components like LCD screens, circuit boards, flame retardants are needed for devices for various reasons, but are difficult or expensive to recycle. Some metals are easy to extract and reuse, but there are a group of 17 metal elements used in smartphones and other devices that are really hard to extract. So they, plus what surrounds them, ends up being wasted. The hands down biggest concern by experts is how much e-waste is being generated and the pace. Our e-waste continues to grow each year and recycling can't keep up. The waste is growing at a rate of five times that of recycling. Not only does this mean finding places to put the waste, but in developing countries, the waste can sometimes be put into landfills with other waste and interfere with natural decomposition. Another concern is the speed of consumption of precious resources. It's estimated that currently on average, only 20% of precious metals are recycled, and that increases to 60% for other metals like copper. But even with a higher percentage of copper being recycled, it still can't keep up with demand. The third area that keeps experts up at night are the impacts to atmosphere and CO2 emission. Recycling uses way less energy than new production. As examples, recycling aluminum uses about 95% less energy than mining, and producing a single smartphone generates about 85 to 95 kilograms of CO2 emissions, which is equivalent to charging your phone for over a decade. Other concerns include the toxic materials released from e-waste like mercury and flame retardants. There's a lot of discussion on things that could help reduce e-waste, changing consumer behavior, better recycling techniques. But the big question is, where is the effort worth the squeeze? In business, we often look for what effort is going to yield the biggest results. And there are two areas that jump out as being the biggest bang for your buck. Design for recycling is the idea of companies designing their electronics with the end-to-end -end life cycle in mind. Doing this could help with recycling, creating easy separation of materials, clear labeling of what materials are for recycling, standardization of components, or designing for durability or reuse of devices. Now, regulation can be a touchy subject as a concept, but for this topic, consensus is there's a few types that could help. Some as simple as incentives for companies, and others would involve setting up recycling centers or mandating the recycling of some materials. To date, though, regulation to help with e-waste is inconsistent globally. In the U.S., it's regulated at a state level, and only 25 states plus D.C. implemented e-waste recycling programs. New York is actually the first state to require producers of electronics to provide repair manuals so people can make their own repairs. One area I found to be extremely mind-blowing is that companies are exploring existing methods of metal extraction that use microbes, like bacteria, to help with the recycling process. While the amount of certain metals and devices may be small, some elements like palladium, which is part of the platinum family, are super expensive and worth recovering even a small amount. There's a couple different methods that can recover these metals in a way that researchers believe could be scalable, green friendly, and not as cost prohibitive as traditional recycling. While there's different types of bacteria used for bioleaching, depending on what's being extracted, the process involves placing bacteria in a controlled environment with the waste. The bacteria then feed on the waste and as a result, dissolve the metals with the acid they produce as a byproduct. The metals can then be extracted from the liquid produced through various scientific processes. Bioabsorption is when microbes actually bind with the metals, extracting them from the waste. Scientists can then separate the bacteria from the metals and reuse the metals. When I started learning about this topic, the first thing I asked myself, and maybe you're doing the same, is why aren't we doing these things? Well, unfortunately, like all things, it comes down to cost, and I don't know when that will be solved for in the short term. But I hope, if nothing else, this episode got you thinking about where you can help, because we can all do our part. I'll see you next week.